Praise him. Praise him. You are not alone if you are lonely when you feel afraid. You're not the only, we are all the same in need of mercy. To be forgiven and be free It's all you got to lean on But thank God it's all you need, yeah And all the people said amen Whoa, oh, oh, oh. and all the people said amen Give thanks to the Lord For His love never ends, yeah And all the people said amen If you're rich or poor well, it don't matter, weak or strong, you know love is what we're after. We're all broken, but we're all in this together. God knows we stumble and fall. And he so loved the world, he sent his son to save us all, yeah. And all the people said amen. Whoa, oh, oh, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for His love never ends, yeah. And all the people said amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit who are torn apart. Blessed are the persecuted and the pure in heart. Blessed are the people hungry for another star. For theirs is the kingdom, the kingdom of God. said amen whoa oh, oh, oh. and all the people said amen give thanks to the lord for his love never ends yeah and all the people said amen yeah and all the people said amen whoa oh, oh, oh. and all the people said amen give thanks to the lord for his love never ends yeah said amen and all the people said amen amen lift him up praise him yes he is good amen we stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He Together we sing Holy is the Lord God Almighty The earth is filled with His glory Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His 
His glory. We stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. Together we I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is, who was, and who is coming, the Almighty. Great and awe-inspiring are your works, Lord God, the Almighty. Righteous and true are your ways, King of the nations. Lord, who will not fear and glorify your name? Because you alone are holy because all the nations will come and worship before you because your righteous acts have been revealed. The mighty Mighty one has has done done great great things things for me and and his his name name is holy. holy.
Amen. Amen. You may be seated. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt together one more time, church. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, God of glory, majesty, praise for to the key. Uh. 
Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you for your goodness, for your grace. For sending your son Jesus to die for us. So that we might be restored. That we might have a restored relationship with you. God, the creator. Above and over all. Lord, you are mighty. You are able to do all things. You can bring the dead to life. Heavenly Father, I just pray for every heart here that each heart would be prepared to receive the word that you've laid on Pastor Chris's heart. That your, your word would be heard clearly. That Pastor Chris would fade away and that you would be seen. We have seen you this morning, and and Lord, we pray that we would continue to see you, that our focus would be solely on you as we worship through the word. Holy Father, I just lift up each heart here who has not yet put their trust in you and does not yet have the hope that we have as believers. I pray that you would draw them to yourself, that they may be part of the body of Christ, part of your kingdom. Heavenly Father, we praise you, we thank you. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You ever experienced a kid or a child fighting over a toy? <laughs> you ever seen them with the mentality of whatever's yours is mine? And whatever is mine or whatever is yours, I want. You ever experienced that mentality? If you have, raise your hand. All right, very good, good, all right. You know, you ever been in a child care setting or a nursery setting and there's that toy, that toy that has been collecting dust for ages. It's probably got about an inch of dust on it, baby. And all of a sudden, that one child goes over and picks up that toy And now that's the greatest toy to ever have been invented. And every child wants that toy. And thus ensues tug of war. You ever experienced that before? Seen it? Has it happened in your house? I'm sure that it has. All right. You know, see, the thing is, children at times tend to argue and fight over the funniest things, don't they? They do. Do we as adults do the same thing in subtle ways? I mean, we do. I mean, think about it this way. We protect our stuff, don't we? It's like finding that prized tool in the yard when the sprinklers are on. All right? But when you stop and think about Both of these scenarios, when you stop and think about both of these things, it boils down to really a a mind mentality, a me mentality, a me first, a mind first mentality. Because we live in a society that is obsessed with self-fulfillment and self-centeredness. Mine, mine, mine. It's like, what are, what are those, the penguins, right? Okay. Oh, seagulls, thank you, not penguins, thank you. Appreciate that. Hey, I'm always willing to be corrected, all right? But I got to thinking about this is, how does this translate to us as a church? How does this translate to us 
not only as individual believers, but how does it translate to us as a collective body? I mean, we've been going through the book of Acts. We've been looking at the early infant church. We've been looking at how God was doing amazing things through the life of the early believers, the early body, and how even in the midst of miracles and persecution that God was still adding to their number daily. And we see on two different occasions how God was blessing them. And we'll see even more occasions of how God used the early church. But as I was studying and getting prepared for today and our time together, I was looking at this and, and God laid upon my heart this, this unfortunate thought process of self-centeredness and self-entitlement and self-fulfillment. And I thought to myself, this is what society teaches today. And how does this translate to us? How does it translate and how does it infiltrate the church? Because really, our giving depends on our personal happiness and comfort, doesn't it? I mean, I'm, I'm more than willing to give as long as it doesn't affect my financial well-being. I mean, I'm, I'm more than happy to serve as long as it doesn't inconvenience my personal schedule. Or I'm, I'm willing to help as long as it doesn't infringe upon my recreational activities. I mean, that's what society teaches us. And it's infiltrated the church. The thing is, though, when you look, not only in Acts chapter 2, but when you look in Acts chapter 4, we see the exact opposite example, don't we? We do. We see the early church. We see a church community that was characterized by giving and self-sacrifice, the self-sacrificial spirit. So this morning, I want us to look at this second example in Acts chapter four, verses 32 through 37. So let's stand together in the honor of the reading of God's word. Chapter four, verses 32 through 37. My, in my Bible, it says, the header says, they had everything in common. It says this. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Father God, we come bowing at your feet this morning. God, may we stay there. Father, we have worshiped. May we continue to worship as a collective body, God, impress upon our hearts that we would indeed, as it says here in your word, to have everything in common. To be of one heart and to be of one soul. It's not about me, it's not about any particular one individual in this place. It's about us as a collective body, and more importantly, 
above all, it is about you. Father, may we continue to sit at your feet, to feast from your word. Father, we love you and we thank you. Open our eyes, open our minds, mold our hearts. In the name above all names, we pray these things. Amen. See, what we've seen is we've seen the early church growing in an extraordinary way. We've seen a thriving, vibrant community. We've seen this happen for a variety of reasons. When you go back and when you look at Acts chapter two, when we looked at this several weeks ago, it's because they had their priorities correct. What were they doing? Well, they were giving themselves to the apostles' teachings. They were fellowshipping together. They were breaking bread together. They were praying together. Really, if you want to call it something, you could call these the four pillars of revival. If you want to break it down. And see, what we saw last week when we looked at the first part of chapter four, there were other characteristics that we saw within the life of the early church. They had extraordinary courage. They had power. They had boldness. I mean, you got Peter who stands in front of the Sanhedrin and he's not backing down. He proclaims the resurrection of Jesus Christ, whom they had allowed to be crucified, the Messiah. And we're going to this week look at another characteristic that was seen in chapter two. We're gonna see another key characteristic of the church this week. Everything in common, generosity, a key Incredible characteristic of a giving body, a generous community that they shared everything that they had. Because see, at the beginning of Acts chapter four, what we saw is we saw Peter and John persecuted. They were persecuted, they were threatened, but then they were released and they came back to the early church and the early church, re church rejoiced. They celebrated, they thanked God but they also thank God not just for Peter and John being released, but they also thank God because they were allowed to suffer for the cause of Jesus. I think this is a key. I think this is a key to the early church. It's a key for us as a church because what we've seen thus far We've seen that they didn't allow persecution. They didn't allow struggle to dissuade them. They put aside any personal differences. They looked to the betterment of the body as a whole. They looked to the sake of the body as a whole. The church today can learn a lot from the first church in Acts, amen? So this morning, we're gonna look at these verses together. When you look at verse 32, what do we see? We see a oneness, a oneness. If you remember the words of Jesus in Matthew 16, I will build my church, is what he says in verse 18. I mean, the, the words of Jesus were not unfamiliar to the people of that time, to the listener. Because shortly after he said this, it came to be understood that he was referencing the believers, the congregation in Christ. Because we understand, you and I know now today, even more so, but I think we forget at times, Jesus wasn't referencing a building. 
He wasn't referencing a synagogue. He wasn't referencing a temple. He wasn't referencing a chapel. What was he referencing? He was referencing a people. The people are the church. That's who Jesus was referencing. Not a meeting place, but believers. That's why, as believers, we can't get hung up on the word church being a structure or a place, but a body. Church, I'd love to see us one Sunday morning have church on the parking lot. I bet that would surprise some of you, wouldn't it? Set up some folding chairs, have an acoustic guitar, no microphones, and just do church out here. What do you think? Could we do it? Amen? Some of you might go, but it's okay. Just a thought. Anyway, moving on. What's that? Okay, see? What if it's in the hundreds? Who knows? Anyway. But we're a body of like-minded, God-honoring believers. That's what we're called to be. That's who we're called to be together. To fellowship as one another, to minister together, to go out together. Verse 32, now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. See, the full number, what this means, this means a great multitude. The last number that we saw when we looked at the last chapter was what? 5,000. Probably more at this point. And the word believed reminds us of the understanding of oneness. To be persuaded, to fully rely upon And see, understand that if if you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're not part of the body. You're not part of the church. If you're not born again, you're not part of the body of believers. But I'm telling you something right now. There is nothing that we desire more than to see Someone come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and to be baptized into the body of believers. There is nothing that we want more than if there's someone here today that doesn't know Jesus as the King of kings and the Lord of lords to accept him, to repent, to come to know him and to be baptized into serving and be a part of this body. That is the goal. And I'm telling you something right now. You can today. And see, with that thought in mind, what you have is you have believers. Believers that were of one heart and one soul. The Greek actually reads, the heart and soul were one. All together. They had a harmony in thought. They had a harmony of affection. Their head and their heart were together. They shared a common love. They shared a common life, if you will. I mean, they, they loved the Lord together. They, they had a, the, the Holy Spirit was indwelling among them, and because of that, they had this oneness. They had the unity. They, had, they were one accord. They were in harmony together. They loved one another because that's what they were called to do. But how in the world can 5,000 plus people 
honestly be of one heart and of one mind? How could that happen? Because their heart and their mind was on Christ and on his lordship and on his mission. That's why. Not only that, because they truly believed that he died for them and that he was raised from the dead. They were convinced of his mission and they gave of their hearts to one another and they shared everything that they had with those that were in need just like they did at the beginning of the early church in Acts chapter two. See, the Puritan preacher, Thomas Brooks, made this statement. Discord and division become no Christian. For wolves to worry the lamb is of no wonder. But for a lamb to worry another lamb, that is unnatural and monstrous. We should not be worrying one another. That's what that's saying. I mean, because if you look at the beginning in Acts, you see a oneness, you see a unity all throughout where we've gone so far. Acts 1.14 says, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. Acts 2.1 says, on the day of Pentecost, they were all together in one place. Acts chapter two, verse 44, and they all who believed were together. Imperfect tense, meaning they made it a practice of coming together all the time. This is what we've been looking at over the last several weeks. The importance of being together, church. And here's the thing, here's a powerful thought. When we're of one heart and one mind, when we're of unity in our heart and our soul, when we do this as believers, think about what Jesus says in John 17, 21, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. When we're all together, when we're of one heart, one soul, unified, the church as we're called to be, the picture that the world sees. What an amazing tapestry, amen? So not only are we called to a oneness, but we're also called and we see a great witness to the resurrection found in verse 33. And with great power to the apostles, we're giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. The words grace and power. The word great is used here. In the Greek, it's megaths. It means a high level. It means impressive, all right? They were giving their testimony to the resurrection. They were doing it with great power. And the problem that you have is it was offensive. It was offensive to the religious leaders of that time. Thus, the persecution. They had power to advance the gospel. I mean, remember that verse? It's, it's a well-known one. It's uh, oh, wow. Acts 1.8, I think it is. 
Yeah, yeah, Acts 1.8, that, that verse that you and I are called to be, what are we called to be? We're called to be witnesses, yeah. Well, what, what, is that, what does that say? Oh, it's, it's, on, it's on one of these slides, I think, Zeb. Oh, there it is, okay. Read this with me, church. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. There's a, a, a key word, you. But what happens is you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon who? You. Okay? See, the early church gave great witness to the resurrection gave great witness to what had happened, and they did it with power. They did it through the power of the Holy Spirit. They gave testimony to anyone and everyone that would listen. They gave testimony to the life of Jesus Christ, Christ himself, the great testimony of salvation, the grace that had been poured out upon them, the grace that is poured out upon you and I, the undeserving, we don't deserve it, but it's been poured out. And see, the heart of the early church was full of God's grace and they shared it with anyone and everyone that was around them again this word you it applies to you all of us as believers as witnesses Christ crucified and raised from the dead is our testimony. It's powerful, church. It's huge. And so we have to ask ourselves, to what extent are we willing to sacrifice for his purpose? Look, it's not a command. It's, it's we've got to be willing to do it. We've got to be willing to sacrifice because when the spirit works in us, when we're spirit filled and we allow the spirit to work in us as a person, when we have power, you know what we wanna do? We want to work for him. We're to go forth personally and unified. So the question is, are you and I as eager, are we as willing as the first church was? I can't answer that question for you. That's a question that you have to answer for yourself, seeking the will of God, seeking the power of God. So not only that, but then when you see the next portion, they had a great witness to ministering. In verses 34 through 37, it says this, there was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus, Joseph who was also called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. We see ministering here happen through generosity. I remember we talked about in Acts chapter two in verses 44 through 45, it says, and all who believed were together and had all things in common and they were selling their possessions and their belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any 
had need. Look, they felt like what they had was not theirs. And so they gave up what they could and everything they could so that others could live. The early church was others-centered, not self-centered. When they saw someone in need, what did they do? Whatever they could to help out. They took their things, and the word divided means to partition thoroughly. That's what that means. See, they had this mentality. It went like this. It went God first, people second, material possessions way off over here. That's exactly what it was. As one author, a pastor stated, he said it this way. First, it was servanthood. Everyone placed themselves in the service of others. Then it was selflessness. They placed the needs of others ahead of their own greeds. And then it was sacrifice. They gave up of their own possessions to help those who had a need. They made sure that everyone within their community, that no one was lacking. They repented of all of their hoarding and they gave up of their own possessions. They truly loved one another. They truly cared for one another. 1 John 3, 17 through 18 says, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Dear children, let us not love in word or deed, but in deed and in truth. See, what the early church did was simple. They pinpointed the needs and they met them. They met them both inside and they met them outside the church as well. See, we have to remember what you and I have, it's not ours to start with, is it? I mean, Psalm 24 speaks to this. Psalm 24, one, when it says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. We're called to do what we can with what we have. See, the people of the early church mobilized for ministry. That's what they were trying to do because they were living on mission. They were living on mission. And the thing is, is that they knew that God wanted to use them. They knew that God wanted to do something amazing through them. And see, here's the thing. I, I got to thinking about that very thought. They were mobilized on mission. They were mobilized for ministry. And I look around in here today, and there are a lot of you that are mobilized for ministry, mobilized for mission. But here's the thing. There are people in here, you can't do everything. But everybody could do something. So if I were to come down and sit by you, put my arm around you, and ask you, how is God using you to be on ministry, to be on mission? What would your answer be? He used the early church guarantee you he can use us. Amen? I mean, Acts eleven twenty nine 29 speaks to this. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. 
And I don't want us to get caught up on or hung up on that it was just simply material needs that were met. No, it wasn't just material needs. They met spiritual needs as well. They spiritually cared for one another. Why? Because they were people-oriented. Just like the early church, you and I are called to meet each other's needs, both material and spiritual. We're called to bear one another's burdens. We're called to pray for one another. When we do this, what an amazing testimony. When you and I, as a body of believers, care for each other, when we meet each other's needs, both physically and spiritually, and when a lost and dying world gets wind of what's happening, do you understand the picture that the world sees. It's an amazing one. The world sees something different in the body of believers. Not fighting and bickering among themselves or trying to put themselves one in front of another, but they see a people of one heart and one what? Soul. Unified. Because why? Because they had everything in common. And see, I believe that there's a reason also that this chapter ends with an amazing example of Barnabas. An amazing individual that showed his care for the body as a whole. They name his spiritual gifts, exhortation, encouragement, consolation. He was completely and totally committed to Christ. At one point, he defended Paul to the early church because they were afraid of him because of his persecution. There are other things that he did as well that showed his care for the body. But he also, when you stop and think about it, when you read James 2, 15, it says, when a brother or sister is without clothes or food, and you say, go, be warm and filled, and you don't do anything to meet their needs, you miss the point. And see, Barnabas did the exact opposite. He showed the early church how much they meant. And he showed the early community how much the church cared about them. See, what happens is is that when we have this same mindset, when we have this same structure, when we're of one heart, when we're of one soul, this lifestyle draws people to Jesus. Because it's something people can see. It's something that people, that we can help them understand. And I'm gonna be honest with you, church. I think in today's day and age, I think it's something that society is longing for. I think that society wants to see the church rise up and show the love of Jesus in a practical way through our actions, through our words, and through our deeds. Are we willing? Are we willing to be that spirit-filled church that has been planted in Boonville to make an impact? Are we willing? See, the first church of Jerusalem valued ministry 
and the love of Jesus over everything. They had been given time and talent and possessions and they didn't use it for their own gratification and glorification. They used it for the glory of God. So the thought is this. The early church was exhausted to a point. They were willing to get exhausted. Why? Because they gave up of themselves whenever they could. They had everything in common and they were willing to give it all up to help produce a rich harvest. See, when the church is great, there is a great unity. Their hearts beat together in spiritual oneness. The understanding of putting Christ first. A common focus upon Jesus and his mission. And see, when we do this, not only do we experience power, do we not only do we experience grace, but the community and beyond around us, they see Jesus through us because they see the resurrection power of Jesus through the church. So the question then becomes, does the community of Boonville see FBC as a church full of power, full of grace, and a caring and giving church, a caring and giving community? Something to chew on. Would you bow with me? See, when you look at the book of Acts, when you look at chapter four, We see different facets, different aspects that have happened, but it's for the good of the early church. And what we see at the end as we've looked at today is that they had everything in common. They looked out for the good of each other. They met needs. And when they did these things, They saw the gospel spread as a result. So for us, I mean, how much are we willing to give up for others? How much are we willing to sacrifice? The early church was willing to give up its property. It was willing to give up its possessions because they wanted to meet the needs of one another. But they, they were following the example of the master. They were following the example of Jesus Christ. Reminded of 2 Corinthians 8, 9, that says this, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, that you by his poverty might become rich. You know, maybe you're here today and you've never experienced the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. I mean, stop and think about it. He he gave up his life for you. He gave up his life for you 
and was raised from the dead so that you can have the opportunity to spend eternity with him. He loves you that much. All you have to do is accept him. Believe that he did that. Believe that he died for you. Believe that he can he forgives you of your sins. And come to and just accept him as your Lord and Savior. It's that easy. Or maybe, maybe you've never connected yourself with a body of believers. Or maybe you've been a part of this body. God's been tugging on your heart to get back into being of one heart and one soul. Being like-minded, having everything in common. It's amazing what God can do with a body of believers who are unified in Him. So here in a moment, the praise team is going to sing a song of invitation. This altar is open. If God's tugging on you today, don't ignore him. Maybe you're here and again, you've never accepted him. Come talk with us. We would love to pray with you. Maybe God's calling you to be a part of this body. We would love to pray with you. Maybe you just need to have someone pray with you, to pray over you because you're struggling with something that's going on in your life right now. We want to pray with you. We want to pray over you. That is part of what the body does. We lift one another up. We bear each other's burdens. Whatever it is, this is the time for you to do business with God. Don't ignore it. Let's stand together as we sing. We are called to be God's people, showing by our lives His grace. One in heart and one in spirit, sign of hope for all the race. Let us show how he has changed us and remade us as his own. Let us share our life together as we shall around his throne we are called to be God's servants working in his world today taking his own task upon us all his sacred words obey let us rise to his son worship together through one more song. Blood and in his name 
In His freedom I am free For the love of Jesus Christ Who has resurrected me